Kamala's economic policy. Red lines are brat. Kamala's plan to ban price gouging in grocery stores. It drives me crazy. Planned Parenthood also announced they would be providing free vasectomies. No, but seriously, how does the abortion thing work? Do we know? Like the actual logistics of setting up a food, an abortion truck, it's and just truck. planning on doing abortions that day in the truck? Or? Welcome to Pirate Idol. I mean, the hotly anticipated segment. There's a difference between having the right take and being entertaining. You failed spectacularly at one of them. <laughs> and, um... Damn. Jesus Christ, Martin. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the pod. We have with us the legendary Martin Screlly. Welcome back, my friend. We are doing... Uh, Martin's going to be guest co-host. And, I mean, we had a lot. We have a lot. There's a lot going on in the Pirate Wars, Pirate Wars universe. Pirate Wars. That's actually how... What's his face said it on the, uh, the Joe Rogan pod? That's no, our was, new name, actually. It was Tucker. Oh, it was, it was on Tucker. It was on Tucker. Yeah, was on yes. Joe. Uh, there was a story in uh, Pirate Wares. Um, Pirate so Wares. Martin is going to be, uh, he's co-host today, but also a guest judge for Pirate, Pirate Idol. Pirate <laughs> Idol. Um, very excited. We have a bunch of, uh, we have four potential co-hosts who are going to come in and battle it out take by take on the topic of nuclear energy in Germany, which is extremely, it's like a very stupid nation, a very stupid topic. We're excited to talk about it. We're excited for them to talk about it. We're excited to judge them while they are talking about it. Um, something to look up, uh, look forward to. We have a ton of pieces that we've been publishing in Pirate Wires. Brandon has been just like relentlessly editing stuff. So go to piratewires.com. Make sure you're subscribed to The Daily so you're getting the updates on the bottom of like what we're publishing. Um, also, just there are some great takes in The Daily. And let's just get on with it. Um, Martin, this one is going to be to you, uh, but I want to tee it up for you. So obviously, there's a lot that we have to cover today, but the one that we have to cover is Kamala's economic policy. Mm. We've been talking about a lot online uh, for good reason. It's very important. We finally have a policy. Uh, so bread lines are brat. Let's talk about it. Um, we have sort of evolved from coconut season to like the question of maybe, is it a coconut mirage? Uh, and we'll get more into this sort of polling in, in, <laughs> in, in our poly market segment, which will be coming up. Uh, but she released, so Kamala, explosive, people are excited, um, have never been so excited, not since Obama, I'm hearing. I mean, people are really losing their minds out there on on this topic. Uh, she releases her economic policy. So a sampling of things that I've seen. Uh, $25,000 subsidies for buying a house, uh, wiping out literally all medical debt, a proposal on uh, unrealized gains, which I'd ha Martin, you can kind of unpack that in a minute and what that means. I think it's worth having that conversation. Um, and probably most famously, we have uh, the question of, and I say question because it's been challenged relentlessly now by the media, price controls via Kamala's plan to ban price gouging in grocery stores. This is part of her broader and the Democrats' broader uh, tactic or strategy of trying to um, convince you to not ask about inflation, which they have caused with their uh, spending policies. Now, uh, Axios is defending this. They are saying this is not price controls. This is price gouging, a price gouging ban. Very different. We can have that conversation. Let's talk about it. It is funny because they got community noted into absolute like outer space over it drives the me crazy. because they have said they've used this phrasing themselves. And also, I mean, Axios has been caught up in this stuff before. We have the Atlantic saying, don't trust. The, it's okay not to trust the economists, uh, which is funny. They finally found a class of expert they don't care about only in this one context. Um, and uh, and I guess it's just like this overall question of, you know, I I've been referring to Kamala for a while as like little coconut, coconut queen, uh, but things have changed. Is this uh, communism with a K they're asking in the New York Post. I prefer the question is like, is this the rise of Hugo Chavala, if you will? Um, but uh, I don't know. There's a lot to talk about here with the analysis. Um, just first reaction to uh, Hugo Chavala's economic plan. Martin, what are you seeing out there? So, so before we even get into that, like I actually would take issue with this idea that she is that popular. And again, maybe this is just me like being in denial. But to me, 
I think the media is forcing the Kamala's popular and people love her narrative down our throat. People actually loved um, Obama. When I met Peter Thiel 15 years ago, I, we actually fought over whether or not Obama was cool. And uh, he, he took the no side. Uh, and I, I was kind of like, I don't, like, I don't hate him that much. Uh, Kamala really doesn't have the redeeming quality. She's like the $5 billion pre-money startup that like <laughs> got like – you know, is on Series D, has no revenue. But she's Sequoia- Magic Leap. She, she, yeah, she's Magic Leap. I mean, it, she's, she is like, yeah, Sequoia put in a lot in Series D. So we're going to mark it up from, you know, uh, two billion to five billion. And then the round fails. The company shuts down. And everyone is like, what, what the fuck was that? And, and I think it's just people forcing this opinion. Uh, in terms of the econ- economic stuff, obviously it, it's a disaster, like on its face. What I tried to do on Twitter, is, is I really tried to sort of like try to be uh, generous and uh, like, how could we make this stuff work? What's the best possible light we could put this stuff in? And there's been a lot of misinformation too about what exactly is her policy because some people say, well, our 50% cap gains tax is long-term, but it only would apply certain strata of income. So if we take it on its face that a 50% long-term capital gains would apply on any capital gains. I think that's a really wild proposal because most of the wealth and value in this country is created through capital. All right, so there, I think there are two big things that people are discussing. One is the price gouging ban, and I think it's a, I, I think it's a mistake to focus on that one because we don't even really know what she. I mean, we could talk about it. It's very stupid the way they framed it. But I, this the unrealized gains thing is potentially crazy. Um, can you explain? Because it's only on gains of, I think, it's supposed to target only people with like, what is it, 100 million? Yeah. Thing? This is an Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg tax. I mean, that, and so basically, you know, the, the borrow, spend and die philosophy, if anybody hasn't heard that, you basically are, you go public. This would only apply to like public companies. And by the way, which would force even more companies to stay private uh, as a result. But if you're Zuckerberg, or Bezos, probably a lot of people don't know how much cash these guys actually have on hand. And, you know, it's a lot. And how do you get that cash? Well, you go to Morgan Stanley, you go to Goldman Sachs and you say, look, I've got $50 billion of stock. Can I borrow a billion dollars against that? And they say, sure. And they, you borrow the money and you don't pay taxes on that because it's a loan. If anything, you got to pay interest on the loan. So why would you pay capital gains tax? And the idea that, well, you're up on your stock by 50 billion. Not only uh, are we going to stop you from borrowing against your stock, but we also want to tax you on the gains you made. Uh, and, and there's no idea here as to how do you, how would you implement that? And so my charitable view is, okay, let's say after 10 years of having sat on a gigantic capital gain, perhaps then, you know, you could have a tax of some kind of wealth tax, basically. And again, this is me really trying to make this work. But the problem with that, as we all know, is that what happens when that stock drops 50%, you know, and you've basically paid the wealth tax, which I'm guessing is not going to be a small tax. And then the stock's down 50% and you've basically lost most of your wealth. Yeah. Does the government Uh, pay you back? So is the government by doing this, taking on a crazy liability? So let's say you, you, you start a company and your stake goes from zero to 50 billion, amazing success. And they say, you know what? We're going to deem the 50 billion you made. We want, we want, a, we want a, a, a stake in it, uh, which is really wild. Cause by the way, there are, I mean, they can wait for death tax, right? Like it's going to eventually that thing's going to be sold. No stock in America stays forever. So the idea that like we need to get it now. We're going to get it someday. <laughs> There's the only two certain things in life, right? Like, so, like, why do we need to take Elon's money now? Yeah. As opposed to like when the guy, I hope it never happens, passes away, gives his stock to a foundation, you know, something like that is going to happen someday. It happens with everyone. And in fact, you do see the Zuckerbergs, the Bezos is selling their stock. Yeah. Like they eventually do diversify. You so, kind of touched on it a second ago. You said this is basically a tax on like five people. We're, we're, right. we are, we're targeting this very small group of people, it seems, who have over $100 million in the stock, who are not who are doing the, the sort of borrow strategy that you were talking about. There is this snippet of an interview back in the Obama days that I think is pretty telling here. Back then, they were talking about an increase in gains tax. Now, since then, over the last eight years or whatever, the Democrats have been increasingly interested in taxing gains um, 
before they were realized. But this was still a, a, a post-realized gains world. And Obama, so it's like, you know, this guy's saying, listen, if you do this, it's not going to pay back any of our debt. It's like nothing actually. Like it's actually not that much money. It's like, it seems to really suck for the top wealthiest in America, but you, it's not as much money as, as you're sort of pretending and you're not going to be able to do anything with it. It's not going to help. It's signaling. I mean, AOC famously had a policy guide that said every billionaire is a policy mistake. Yes. And, so, and th- this is the extension of that. But I- a- she comes from that. Obama straight up says, well, Charlie, so is Charlie Gibson. Well, Charlie, uh, what I've said is that I would look at raising the capital gains tax for purposes of fairness. So now our tax policy is no longer about funding our increasingly bloated government or paying down our right. chaotic, no. like existential debt at this point. It's it virtue is, signaling. It's, puni- it's actually punishment. It's yeah. straight up like, I am going to punish these rich people. Uh, I think that is one in itself dark and like we don't want to go down that road. But more importantly, too, on the gains itself, if I mean- Income tax started this way. It started as something that, that targeted the, the ultra wealthy, and then it, it gradually came to target everybody. If they start doing this, and this affects now all of all of our all of us. Let's say even just like reasonably wealthy people, people who are worth ten million or more, right? People who are starting businesses. Who is owning? Who is owning an asset that's you know pre gains? It's like if you have a company that's worth something. That is worth something that you can actually value. If you have a home that's worth something that you can actually value. If you have to start selling some piece of that that is that's a nightmare that's certainly the end of i mean uh, that is a huge hit to to entrepreneurship generally and then also just i think all of us well imagine imagine somebody comes to america and starts a laundromat company and they build it up and what's the mark to market i mean do we do a dcf of the laundromat and say well it's worth 20 million congratulations you came from a different country and you came to america and you made it and you owe us 4 million yes <laughs> and you're looking yes. around and you're like well, who's what, value- do I, what do i do that is such a, another great there are a lot of great points here because the idea is crazy and there's a reason that we have done it but you're right like how do you value these companies in tech how do we value a company before it's public it's just like guys saying shit it is like really it is look, look at theranos on theranos elizabeth holmes owes the government a billion dollars right and what <laughs> like what is it actually what is it actually worth like we never know this in business until it goes public and the public decides based on what they're willing to pay what are people willing to pay for a share of that right like before that you're in vc territory the valuations are very different and like so who are you going to have making these determinations on on what a business is worth certainly not someone who's competent in business it's going to be I, someone I think it's all about signaling right i mean they know they can't you can't actually logically implement this so it's more showing the voter hey i'm beating up elon i'm beating up you know uh whoever and i think that they're it's also showing themselves because a lot of people say elon's elon's the shadow president and whenever the government's kind of tried to poke a stick at elon he's now got a megaphone where he says fuck you i don't care i laugh at you you're nobody to me and that's not something that the government likes i learned that the hard way i i i uh was so below Elon, but the point is that you know by making that kind of messaging, you make a lot of enemies because government people—that's the one thing they have. They have a little bit of power, and they want to hold on to it. And anybody who tries to subjugate the power, it's very scary. So the response from them is, "Well, what can we do to bother this class of people?" And under the guise of like paying the deficit or under the guise of of equality or fairness, I do think that Americans aren't going to buy this. I think that Americans look up. Many Americans look up to Elon, and people like him. And it's the American dream. It's still there. It's a reason that we're different from Europe and that people look at this and say, well, how do we don't these people pay the most taxes to begin with? And now we want to tax them before they even make the money. Man, (laughs) I don't agree with you. I wish that you were right. I really wish that you were right. But it seems to me that the public is totally bought in on the concept of like, it is we are being treated unfairly and these rich people are getting away with murder. I think it's always been that way. And I think there's sort of no way to win against a party that is telling you that if you're confirming that weird suspicion that you want to believe that like none of your problems are really your problems. There's this evil minority class of billionaires who have hoarded all of the wealth and like they're treating you unfairly. And like, wouldn't it be nice if I just wiped out all of your medical debt by making them pay their fair share of taxes? I think the average person says, fuck yes, which is why weird take. Tell me what you think. All of you guys, I kind of have, re- I've gotten on board with Trump's deranged economic plans also, like I think that you do need both parties to be crazy at this. You can't have only one party be crazy. I think if it's only one party that's crazy, you definitely lose because the crazy party is going to win on economics. But if both parties are crazy, if like 
the left is saying we're going to liquidate Elon Musk, but the right is saying we're going to take <laughs> all the, the right saying like we're going to take every house that politicians own after their first house, we're going to seize it and we're going to give it to the people to have so everyone gets a house in America. We're making it everyone gets a house in America promise or something like that. Like if they get even crazier, like maybe there's mutually assured destruction in in in, in economics or or in politics for the first time ever. In well not ever, but probably since FDR. I don't know. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think you're right. This is the way you win elections. I, w- I would say, first thing, it's good that Kamala is talking policy for once. That's a win. Um, but yeah, the for, second thing for is- For everyone who hates her, it's a win, right. which we can talk yeah, about yeah. in our poly market segment. Right, right. But I do wonder, um, yeah, like this is the way you move elections or you win elections. So I do wonder um, how much, like for how insane Kamala's policies are, like I do wonder how much it's going to move the needle electorally. And if not, like, is it just going to benefit her? Um, because you mentioned the 25K for a house, like a lack of- uh, young home ownership is actually like a really big problem in this country. So if people just hear like without getting in the weeds of it, if they just hear 25 K for a house, they think that's a good thing. Dude, um, she talked so about I, wiping out yeah. medical debt, like all of it. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a, I don't know how you, you're solid with debt. I don't know how you look at that and don't think maybe that the student debt thing also, like, I mean, there are many people, like, there are reasons that all these things are bad, but I'm saying like, if, if you're just trying to sort of sociopathically gain votes by promising things that are not fair and that you can't do, then that's compelling to a certain kind of idiot person who is, by the way, the average voter in this country is is not like a genius. I did see a statistic that 10% of Americans are millionaires. Um, so I do think that if, if you're not a millionaire, which is most people, you, you may be the dependent of one. Right. Like, you know, it's gotten to a point where there's some sophisticated person in your household, ideally, that is like, hold on, you know, this is maybe not a great idea. And I want to talk about price gouging since I'm, I'm sort of the guy there anyway. Um, you know, it's a real pet peeve of mine, as you can imagine. Gouging is when there's COVID and your, your local deli or grocery store charges $100 for rolled toilet paper. That's price gouging. There's some transient phenomenon that is being taken advantage of. Price changes are permanent, right? They're not meant to exploit some weird dislocation of demand and supply. And the price increases we've seen in the most mundane shit, right? I mean, food, food markets are like the most, like, if you ever traded commodities or anything like that, like corn or OJ, this stuff rec- like um, fixes itself to the right supply demand so quickly because a farmer's like, yeah, I'm going to grow less oranges. <laughs> and he's just like, like that, you know, the price normalizes correctly. So like these are goods that they are a little more volatile than normal goods, but they, they normalize so fast that this increase we've seen in the price of a vegetable or the price of milk or something, it's, it's not because of price gouging. <laughs> it's because of pure demand and supply and, and the supply of money specifically. Well, I have a question on the actual policy. So let's say it was price gouging. Let's say somehow, I guess all of the grocery stores in the country got in a Zoom call and they were like, yeah, we're going to fuck Americans right now. And like, we're going to increase the cost of bread by precisely the rate of inflation, just sort of coincidentally. That's what we're choosing to do. Um, If they did that, then you would have to, what to stop that? You would have to say, we're going to set a to, to determine what is an un, to determine what's an unfair price, you ha- you have to set a fair price. So that is what a price control. You're setting the fair price. That's they did the price well, control. How, well, I don't understand. So tell me, how is it? They, not they, price- they've done this once. They've done this once in pharma. Uh, so in pharma, if you raise the price higher, and I know this because I, I, I tripped this law. If you raise the price higher than this than the CPI, um, you know the cumulative CPI. You have to pay back the excess. Uh, if you're, if you have Medicare or Medicaid, Medi- Medicare or Medicaid are only like 25% of, of revenue, but I had to write a check to the government for a, like a excess price increase law. And so it kind of exists in, in pharma. And so what, what Kroger or Walmart would have to do is say, all right, I raise the price of milk from two to 250, but CPI only was two to 220, let's say. And they'd have to write a check for 30 cents to, who? <laughs> the government? Like it's, it doesn't, or the government can force you at to price at 220, which is the, the price control. Right. There's sort of two ways to do it, I guess, but it has been done. But then of course, back in reality, where the grocery stores are not price gouging, um, there is a, I think a pretty common sense sort of question, which is like, why if a price is set and that price 
means that I will lose money selling this product or just not make enough of it to make it worth my while, why will I carry that product? And the answer is, you wouldn't. And that is how price controls have led to famine everywhere they've ever been implemented when it comes to food. But who do you think sets the price? It's the farmer who sells the stuff. So Kroger has to buy it from somewhere. And Kroger's just putting a fucking 3%, you know, uh, markup on it, which is their gross margins, like 10% or something. And, you know, Farmer Joe says, okay, Kroger has to buy my stuff at 220 instead of 250, which is what I want to sell it for. Well, it cost me 220 to make it. So I don't want to sell to Kroger for 220. I'm out of business. So, you know, it, it's going to trickle down all the way down to the, the product creator. I guess and- there is a question of just, we have it like, is it even, is this just them saying stupid shit? And like, they're saying it to distract you from inflation. They're not actually going to do anything. This is maybe why oh, you, you see them. I, Go ahead. Yeah. I think they just basically did this like bureaucratic McKinsey, like politician thing where they were just like, let's get a focus group. And uh, 10 people out of 10 people, 3.6 people said they were concerned with the price of groceries. <laughs> and they're like, okay, let's make a policy about that. What can we do about that? And then they're just going to go down the list. Whereas like Trump has this like innate instinct of like, you know, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but he just shoots from the hip of like what his policy should or might be. Whereas I think they just did a, like a systematic thing. And, you know, the average American or the average American in the places they're trying to get votes uh, is concerned about food the price prices. of food, yeah, which is just inflation. I mean, it's it's not just the it's the price. It's, of a, food. it's the definition it's, of inflation. Yeah, it's, right? it's like food, it's housing, it's clothes. <laughs> everything is up, and it's like I don't. Are they all gouged? As every every entrepreneur in the country literally got on a Zoom call from every industry, and they were like, "Let's raise prices by twenty to thirty <laughs> percent." Wouldn't that be illegal too? Like yes, it would be illegal. Would yes, that, it's illegal. Right? So if, who's if doing it? Who's colluding? Happening. Sorry, Brandon. What was your I can't, what was your point? That's my take. Like like that type of coordinated action has uh, absolutely got to be illegal, and it's on the Biden administration if they are not enforcing uh, action against these companies that they're saying are coordinating um, higher prices for the consumer. That would be sweet if the FTC brings a lawsuit against. Every yeah, I want to see that. Yeah, no, every it's... company in America. <laughs> yeah, well, it was. No, I mean, just put your money where your mouth is. I think right. It's yeah. Happening. Let's see the lawsuits. I mean, it's just so it's so transparently not what they believe. They they know that there's not price gouging. And it started with Warren. Like it's in- insulting because it Warren, yes, War well, Warren's very good at this. I think Warren's really smart. I think she's really that's what makes her dangerous. She's really good at picking up on things that are gonna play well polit- like publicly, um, by making arguments that seem based in reality but aren't and they're they're very cleverly constructed and you could sit there and argue with her for however long but um the average person listening is just going to be like i don't know it sounds like the rich people are taking too much and um and that's the genius of a democrat who is able to make arguments like this now kamala is not that good at it kamala is let's be honest I, did she even know this was her policy before one of her aides said it was her policy to a reporter unclear um or uh what was the other one the other stupid thing she's doing is oh the gains gains tax, which will destroy the tech industry, which fucking VCs for Kamala, which we talked about, a, 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 <laughs> I think a couple weeks ago, they, they in their open letter, they're saying that um, if Trump wins, the industry itself could collapse. Um, they say the the, the institutions are, are, that, that he threatens, you know, the lack of them means the collapse of the industry. Now we're talking about potentially a, a pre- what is it? An unrealized gains tax, which actually would end the way that we do things in so, Silicon Valley. Yeah, so I'm an LP in NEA or something, and the vintage uh, does this huge, you know, leap up, and then this huge leap down. This happens sometimes, and I, I can pay taxes at the peak, presumably. And if you know any anything about taxes, you know that your losses carry forward, but you can't apply them against ordinary income. So, like you traditionally. You know, they take at the top, but they don't refund you at the bottom. And uh, that's something that just never happens. If I make $10 million capital gains this year and I lose $10 million capital gains next year, I pay on the, the first and I don't, I don't get the money back in the second. And so the LPs of these funds would be completely torched if if this happened. I think it's more difficult to make an argument against raising the gains tax, even though I think it's unfair and it shouldn't happen. But just raising the gains tax, like realized gains, you sell the stock. Now we're raising it. We're going to we're gonna, we're gonna cripple. Um, we're going to do some stupid draconian, like sixty percent thing because we hate rich people. That's 
really fucked up. And I think it's a dis- it, it disincentivizes building companies. But what it does not do is make it almost impossible to to build them in this way, which in unrealized gains tax, I think would actually do. And like, it's also, I, it's transient. Like if, if they did that, they could see with how the experiment worked. Did it actually generate tax revenue? Did it actually do this or that? And I can wait four years to sell my company, right? Like I can just, you know, okay, eventually the tax rate's going to drop. But the traders, like a lot of us don't give a shit about what happens with the traders anyway. So the short-term tax gains, it's like, okay, some hedge fund buys a stock this week and sells it for next week. Are they really creating value in society? Who really gives a shit what tax, you know, they should be there. But the entrepreneurs of the world that build things, I think that we could all probably wait four years uh, for a long-term tax. And I do think a new administration would fix it. And I also think these things move marginally, which is, again, goes back to the old Obama argument that, you know, he raised ca- capital gains tax like 2% or something, you know, uh, nominally from like 35 to like 37 or something. And it it didn't stop any of us from from building legendary companies, okay. uh, and it's you know something like that's totally fine. Like I, I don't like it. I'm an anarcho capitalist. Right. I want taxes to be zero. So when I said this on Twitter, a lot of people are like, how, how, "Taxation is theft," and it's like, "Yeah, I know, but we have to compromise here." I mean, if they want to take cap gains up two percent or three percent, cool. I mean, like that's not that bad. If, Which maybe if, they want it. Maybe they wanted to compromise all along, but I don't know. I don't think they're that clever. I, they've been asking for an unrealized gains tax for a long time now. Um, Riley, I would love for you to uh, to to break down what we've been seeing there this week. Sure thing. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention first the uh, land acknowledgement that the <laughs> Democratic Party uh, announced in their party platform you at the start make, of the you convention. Make a, make a, you better make a land acknowledgement right now. Where are whose land are you standing on? Nevada. I'm sure we have some tribes, but um, but anyway. So they said um, while we meet in Chicago. Uh, we recognize that this is the traditional homeland of before listing all their uh, Native American tribes that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Um, side note, we looked up on chat GPT how many times those tribes went to war with each other. <laughs> and turns out it was several. But anyway, um, <laughs> but apparently the uh, the DNC is going out of their way to cater to influencers as well at their convention um, at the expense of traditional media, which is a little bit of a funny wrinkle there. Um, but as for actual speakers, uh, it seems from clips that I've seen, um, the person who's got the best reception so far has been Michelle Obama. Um, some notable things I saw from her speech, uh, there seemed to be a subtle shot at the uh, pro-Palestine wing of her party, uh, sort of telling them to like get in line. Um, she said, we cannot be our own worst enemies. Uh, we cannot get a Goldilocks complex about whether or not everything is just right. Um, essentially telling her own party, like if you have issues with your candidate, like pipe down, just enjoy the vibes, enjoy the joy. <laughs> um, but she also didn't mention Biden's name once, which was interesting. Um, but after her, Barack spoke uh, right after, echoed similar calls for unity. Um, notably, though, he also joked about Trump's obsession with crowd sizes while making a gesture to imply he was not, in fact, talking about crowd sizes. Um, but I guess last observation on the topic of sort of phallic things, um, Planned Parenthood, um, also announced they would be providing free vasectomies, um, as well as abortions for all DNC attendees. Great. I am um, yeah. in favor of that at the Democratic National Convention. Was it an abortions or abortion vouchers? I think literal abortions Dude, out of a an truck. An abortion <laughs> voucher is, imagine being handed an abortion voucher. That's what, there's that's no like context the only way in which people could hand you an abortion voucher where you would, where I would, <laughs> I'm shocked just talking about it, to be honest. They're, they're in Happy Meals now. If you open a McDonald's <laughs> Happy Meals, you, <laughs> one, 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 one party wants the, the birth rate to decline. I mean, I think it's, you know, it, tacitly or, or, you know, uh, not, you know, it's kind of scary. And then we have to queerify the, the nuclear arsenal. Yeah. So that's also part of the part of the process no but seriously how does the abortion thing work do we know like because you, you, you have to you want me to give you like the medical breakdown no no like like, <laughs> like the actual logistics of outside. setting up setting up a a food an abortion truck <laughs> and just truck. uh planning on doing abortions that day in the truck or what, what can, is can a democratic congress person preferably a congresswoman give me my vasectomy 
You know, <laughs> <laughs> the second is more straightforward, but like you have to. I mean, plan, I'm sure they would like, love to, to. You have to be pregnant. I'm for sure an they abortion. would. They would love to give you a vasectomy. They want to give all of us vasectomies, <laughs> but sure. specifically uh, Martin. Uh, um, be careful. What you I, say. I have two. Just before we can talk about the abortion vehicle of it all. I would I mean, I have thoughts. You guys all have thoughts. I do just want to on Riley's like the the sort of facts here. I would like to introduce two. One, it can, one more of a wild theory, but that's popular online. And then one that is less of a theory and more of just like a well-reported, I guess, piece of drama. Um, so the Bidens and the Obamas hate each other. Like absolutely from all the reporting I've seen, uh, the Bidens blame the Obamas for stealing this presidency from Joe. Uh, they have a lot of background leading up to this where the Obamas have gotten in the way of Biden um, previously on different runs for the office. They didn't want to support him necessarily uh, four years ago even. Obama thought he was too old. Kamala Harris last night was, she actually had to, she left the convention and uh, did an event, uh, some kind of fundraising event or something to not be on the premises with the Obamas, I believe, to um, appease Joe and his rage for these people who kind of stole this from him. Now, what did the Obamas want? What they did not want also was Kamala. They, Obama's statement was like, we're going to have a, a process um, here to determine who the presidential candidate is going to be after Joe stepped down. And he was, they say, pressured to step down by Obama and Pelosi, but mostly Obama, talking to fundraisers, talking to all of his political allies. Obama's sort of quietly been orchestrating this entire thing. So he gets to the final moment. Joe does step down. Um, but what Joe immediately does is he endorses Kamala Harris. And once the president endorses Kamala Harris, Kamala is like the presumptive nominee. And that happened overnight. Everyone got got everyone was like, oh, I guess she's running, the donors, the public, that was it. It was over. Um, why did Obama want a process? Uh, now, here's where the conspiracy gets, it's, it's not really conspiracy, but the sort of wild theory is that Michelle Obama is in the running and she has been speaking. So on, I've noticed that she's been in the poly market odds forever. Uh, she's one of the top uh, after Biden, but when Biden was still running, uh, even before everyone realized he had dementia officially during the debate, even before that, Michelle Obama was always like 3% chance of being the Democratic nominee. And that's because Democrats are obsessed with her. They absolutely love her. We've done this before with um, the Bushes to an extent, certainly with the Clintons. Uh, we we repeat this this like this like oligarchical family thing where like when there's a popular family member, we want the other one in there because we sort of know that they represent the same thing. Uh, and I I wonder if if we had had a fair like process, would Michelle Obama have thrown her hat in the ring? I think it's actually possible, and everyone was obsessed with that speech she gave last night. I, I, I should say, sort of like finally wrapping it up. I think that's some sort of important additional context of what's going on with the convention right now. You know, I, I sometimes track influencers just for some like data, you know, stuff I do for investing. Michelle Obama has some of the most amount of influencers. Like, top, I think she's in the top 100 um, on Instagram. And it's a really remarkable thing because, followers, you know, right? Is that what you mean? She has the most followers. followers. Yes, thank you. Um, it's a really remarkable number. Um, she's wildly popular. I don't think just with, I mean, probably within Democrats, but like just like 40, 50 million followers and compare that to like Jill Stein, I'm sorry, Jill Stein, Jill Biden or someone like that. Um, it really is a very different, you know, uh, adoration for her. Yeah. She was really popular during Barack's presidency. She was considered one of his like most powerful weapons to bring out. She had broad bipartisan appeal, um, no matter how much right-wing influencers online want to pretend that's not the case, you know, posting like weird, ugly pictures of her and calling her a man. And is she actually trans? Like that's, you can have all fun and games or whatever online trashing whatever political person you want, but she is, people love her. Um, Jill has 3 million followers on Twitter or X, and Mike has 22 million. So it's a really big, big difference. Uh, Mike? Sorry, Michelle. <laughs> um. Yes, I think that uh, I think that it's coming, and I think that she wanted it to come. Do I think that? Uh, I really do. I really think, I really do think that had there been some kind of actual formal process, I think Michelle would have been in that ring, and I also think Gavin Newsom would have been in that ring, just based on what Gavin was doing leading up to that season. And I think the only reason Gavin slowed down at the last minute 
was not because he was worried about Kamala or Biden, but because he was worried about the Obamas. I think he knew that in a fight against Michelle, he would lose and he would sort of maybe lose his chance. Uh, to your point, I think uh, Michelle is sort of like a foil to Kamala in the sense that every time like Kamala gets behind a microphone and says something, people kind of like cringe and are like, what what strange thing is she going to say now? Every time Michelle speaks, people like Democrats are glowing. Like she got the best reception at the convention by far. Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, she is adored among her party for sure. There's a lot of people in the D.C. politics circuit that talk about and think that Michelle is the architect of Barack and that there would be no Barack without Michelle. Not just this old trope of like every behind every man is a strong woman, but like behind every male president named Barack Obama, there's a puppeteer named Michelle Obama. And, um, you know, there's a lot of feelings like that. And I, I don't think there's a single person who's ever been in the White House that says they want to leave. Right. I mean, there's yeah. just just this constant whatever happens there. I have no clue. But once you're in, you seem to want to stay there. And, and to go back a third time, I think would have been, you know, seemingly something they would have wanted. I guess I wonder. Well, I have an answer to my question, but it does seem at face value sort of strange that she didn't go and run for office in the way that Hillary did. But then again, Hillary lost. She, the, she didn't become president. And what Michelle Obama is right now is not politicized entirely in the way that Hillary was once she ran for office. Michelle gets to be popular, generally speaking. And even among people who don't agree with her husband, there's some insulation there from that because she's never held political office. She never actually her her when Hillary was uh, in the White House as the first lady, her first lady's project famously was healthcare, which immediately politicized her. Michelle did the like, let's get fat kids to move thing, which had broad appeal. People want to see fat people exercising. They want it. They like deeply in their bones. They want to see it. And she gave it to them. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, I think that she's learned from Trump as, as well as Hillary's losses. She learned from Trump's victory. You don't have to have been in, in politics to win. She has a very good chance. I think that she's probably going to run for president. And um, I think she's going to be hard to win, uh, to win against, to beat. Brandon, what do you think? Yeah, I think the question is, if Kamala wins, what happens in four years? Is, do we... Uh, I think she's another one term if she if she, if she she wins. Um, I think you, your instinct about, or everybody's here, here's in, instinct about Kamala... Sorry, uh, Michelle being the better candidate than Kamala is correct. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about what happens in four years, given that Kamala is going well, to accept like the Democratic losing. nomination tonight. And Doesn't it just feel that way? Doesn't it? It, it feels like she's losing right now. I don't in know. In a way that it didn't a week ago. I really we'll see. Think so. How I mean, many I more guess... days? Yeah, we have like, what, 70 more days, 80 more days until November. Right. I, think, I think once you have the first debate... You're really going to sort of force this issue of like, well, how do you defend price controls? How do you defend unrealized tax gains? How do you defend all the other bad shit stuff that she's going to say? And I think it's sort of like the Biden debate. All Trump has to do is just shut up. And I think he's kind of been doing that the last few weeks. Maybe it's just because the DNC is going on. But I think like the more, you know, Trump's we've had enough of Trump for eight years. We know what his policies are. Like he doesn't need to say anything. Yeah. You know, we, all we need to do is listen to, to Kamala for the next sort of 60, 90 days and watch the debate. I do think she'll bring up the black, like he, he said, he just found out she was black or whatever. <clears throat> she'll bring that up and it'll be her one sort of huge zinger. Um, Trump has a lot of time to figure out how he's going to answer that. I will say to, the, to that sort of thing that he said, I think what happened there, if you look at black Trump supporters, um, on Instagram or whatever, and I get a lot of reels, and I'm, so I'm always seeing this stuff, and there are tons. Um, this is very, it's like a common thing that that black, like right wing influencers were saying. Not even right wing influencers. I saw the Don Lemon clip the other day uh, where he goes to Atlantic City and he interviews a bunch of people in Atlantic City, but all of them except for one, I think, were black. Atlantic City is a very uh, black city. Um, so he's on the boardwalk, he's interviewing these people. One of them actually brought up the Kamala Black thing themselves, and they were like, they were like clearly in favor of that. And I think Trump made a miscalculation there. Like that's something that maybe black people have this conversation themselves. I think that as a white guy doing it, it comes off really different, including for black people who maybe even agreed with you and were like, who is this person or whatever? Anyway, not endorsing that. I'm just saying it's going to come back up to haunt him. Um, and that's maybe the only thing that he has to worry about in that debate. I think the left is is very has, has turned out to be extremely formidable when it comes to the information war that we're seeing online. Like the the price controls 
conversation, I think is kind of working out in their favor because every time somebody freaks out about price controls, they can just say, yeah, only if you are in control of assets over a hundred million dollars. Oh, so you're, you're simping about, you're, for you're yeah, gains. Simp- the unrealized yes, gains. Yes, tax. yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Unrealized gains. So, and, and I, and I also have this feeling that the right is actually less capable in the information more than the left. When the left is activated, they're pretty good at just being super semantic, engaging in a vicious war of semantics and always sort of somehow turning these issues in, into their favor. And so that's what I worry about for um, for Trump's chances. I don't really worry about what happens in the real world. I think the the, the information war is where, it was, is where a lot of it's happening. And um, again, I think the left has been pretty consistent about how good they've been on that front. Yeah. It's just that they have to be excited about a candidate. And once they are, you have all of the the word cells and the word chats, I consider myself among them, uh, they become activated. And what was happening with Biden is they weren't. I will say I've noticed online a little bit of demoralization. Uh, I, I've seen plenty of journalists. We we're always like the media is totally in the bag for Kamala or whatever. I don't, I think largely, yes, that's true. But then I, the Washington Post had a whole from the editorial aboard, uh, yeah, a critique of Kamala's price control thing and the economic policy stuff. Um, I see everyone on, uh, what is it, CNBC, constant, constantly going after Kamala on all this economic plan. Uh, I see journalists in the Washington, uh, in the Wall Street Journal. I just saw earlier today on on X going after her for this stuff. I When I click onto the New York Times, like, yeah, there's lots of support for her, but there are lots of questions like light on policy, pro like like strong on vibes or i forget what the actual headline was the other day but they're not saying nothing about this um the washington post thing was like apostasy i mean it was like a true break and i also think that i mean this might be just something that bothered me but the there's a the volunteers for kamala input form has about 82 genders on it and (laughs) nine exactly nine including faith Faye, Faye is real. Faye fair. Uh, Faye, is, <laughs> Faye is real. But uh, regardless, the uh, you know that that kind of stuff does have an impact because I think that the original thought is like Kamala and the left would step away from woke, but you now have this increasing like again this queerifying the nuclear agenda or arsenal between that the input form. You, you do seem to have wokeism creeping back in. I do think wokeism is one of these things that almost became bipartisan where even the left has sort of had enough of it. And I think Kamala's embrace. Remember, she was the first vice president with pronouns in her bio. That was really big deal. Well, she went up on stage with Cuomo and she introduced herself as she, her. And then Cuomo said, ah, like me too. And the audience was just silent. Like, what did you just say? Cuomo, Chris, both Cuomos. I have a new theory on the Cuomos. There's a new clip going around of Chris Cuomo. He's on the floor of the DNC complaining about the rich people up in the box. And he's like, this is the uniparty and this is how it works and blah, blah, blah. And I was watching and I'm like, is he a Trump supporter now or is he a communist? I can't actually tell the difference. And I think increasingly that's just politics in America. But one thing is certain, he's no longer pro whatever the blob thing is. As his brother, who was the governor of New York, I mean, he did a lot of damage there on the COVID stuff. But why did he really go down? Why did Chris also at the same time really go down? I think it's because they were no longer part of the machine. And I think that was kind of well known. And I think that all of this, um, so his brother actually, the governor went down for sex stuff. I think it was like a sex scandal of some kind that is unearthed right when he becomes politically useless and used against him to get him out. And then Chris, I forget the reason. I think it might have been actually just his brother. He was like too friendly to his brother on air. And that became a huge scandal. But in hindsight, like, was it that big of a deal? I don't think so. Um, anyway, let's come back to the Pomos one of these days. I think that there are interesting things coming from the Pomo brothers in the days ahead. Might be communism, not entirely sure, but I am interested. Brandon, last topic related to this, um, the sort of, you were just talking about how good these people are at information war. Uh, there was recently the story of the uh, SF Standard wrote a hit piece on Ben Horowitz's wife. And I would love you to break that down for us. Yep. So last week, um, the, 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 the title of the article that you just referred to is called How Ex-Liberal Billionaires Ben and Felicia Horowitz Made a MAGA U-Turn. Um, it, it was pretty scandalous on our corner of Twitter, but maybe our listeners haven't read the piece. 
Um, but the the lead to the piece kind of says it all. The lead reads, they once hosted Kamala Harris and handed out food at Glide. Now they donate to MAGA candidates and live inside a four-gated mansion in Nevada. And essentially- the, Pause really quick. Four-gated. Describe that to me. Uh, there are, somehow there are four gates. Like you have to- <laughs> There's like a sequence of four gates, each one taller than the next. Because like I am interested. I want to know more about the four <laughs> gates. I, I played a video game like that once. <laughs> you need, it'd be that, like you need four keys. Like they, yeah, where they wear the to, keys you around their neck. You have to basically siege like, the, the compound to get in. It won't be, it'll wait like months or whatever, starve them out. I, I don't know. I have no idea what it means, frankly. Um, I, I mean, you know, we can kind of skip the content of the article because it's pretty, it's very obvious what it is. It's, it's basically just like a master class in the type of hit pieces that, are served as punishment for like when somebody I- ideologically defects, right? Like I happen to know the the reporter very well, Emily and Sugarman. Yeah, yes, re- recently fired from the Daily Beast or something like that. That's is that right. right. So, so she was a hit piece writer, and uh, she did about five or six of these numbers on me. So, hmm. I, wait, I she's know- the one that fe- she's not the one that you had the thing with in prison. No, 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 no. Oh, okay, um, so, so, so I would she- have clutched my pearls right now. <laughs> Sorry, continue. She, she's a very pretty uh, young lady. Uh, she's a lesbian. Um, and I, uh, her, her boss basically commissioned all these articles. The editor at the Daily Beast, who was also fired, was this sort of like 400 pound social justice warrior lady that, you know, was basically like, look, we hate Martin Shkreli. We're, you know, here's the hit piece you should write to Martin Shkreli. And basically, you know, she was this hired gun. So to me, I point the, you know, kind of uh, finger up here to, you know, who asked her to write this piece? Because it doesn't doesn't come out of nowhere. Like somebody has an axe to grind, says, Ben and Felicia, write the story. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. And I'm going to go. And she's, I think Emily's actually kind of like a decent investigative reporter, but she's also a hired gun. And and I'm not sure, you know, I mean, she fits fits the bill, but this is how the the democratic this is the democratic party's immune system in action. I, I don't think this is out of character for how they've been treating anybody who ideologically defects over the past four years or so. Rather than engage in the issues that Ben and Felicia uh, supposedly Felicia has um, with um, the Biden administration and and by default the Harris administration, um, they just try to shame and embarrass them. Right, they put and them I, in MAGA hats on the on the yeah, pick, yeah, which was kind of crazy because yeah. I saw that and I actually was like, "Damn, they why would they wear those hats out in public? They're g- obviously going to get roasted for it." It took me a second to realize that was photoshopped. It was very funny in the context of the AI deepfake conversation we're having, where the most believable deepfake I just saw was like a cheap Photoshop job by someone who just hated another person. Um, yeah, that was wild. They were definitely upset about that over at A16Z. Uh, I do think that the point of who are these people who are assigning the pieces though, just like let's get niche in the media stuff is pretty interesting. The well, idea that, yeah. The idea that like they're kind of invisible. They they are this invisible and B- Balaji talks about this quite a bit in the context of the Souls of Burgers. And I don't think I agree with him kind of roughly that that's why aren't we talking about the Souls of Burgers more than we are? They're obviously important. They're obviously influential. They obviously have a lot to do with everything to do with what's going on with the New York Times. But the writers are writing pieces, and I think the New York Times is not as bad as some of these others, the other outlets. Like, you, you, I don't think you would have ever seen a piece like it would have been better than this. It would have been harder to attack uh, if it was in the New York Times. But there are editors who are signing this, and those are the real players. Th- those are like, if you're on a chessboard, right? Like the writers are the pawns, and then maybe maybe the editors are like they're like the bishops or the rooks or something, and then the owner is the king, right? Ultimately, not doing a lot of the the like. How much has Bezos done at the Washington Post? Like he's he's pretty constrained. The the owner of the standards is this is this guy Moritz, right? Who yes. used to be at Sequoia, so is, but is not anymore. So this is what Ben Horowitz alleged. Yeah, right. So they came out. They 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 sort of sniffed out that there was going to be a hit piece published imminently by Horowitz and Andreessen, and basically tried to play offense for for like twenty four hours before the piece came out. Um, and they were claiming that like this is a this is essentially top down from Moritz, um, and the reason was because they're these two groups are in competition with each other somehow. Um, the editor of the Standard, I can't remember what his name is, but it's a guy. 
he actually, he, he totally went to bat for Moritz. I don't know what's true, by the way. I have no inside information, but he was like very vocal on Twitter saying like, you know, it was me and only me who signed, who assigned this hit piece. Was it Jeff Krokovici? I know him. I don't know if it was him. I can't remember his working. name. I, I, I tried to look it up and I can't find it while we're recording, but it's my, his name might be Adam something, but I don't know. The other thing remember. that's kind of interesting is that, you know, Emily's very good at hit pieces, which are generally kind of have these half truths that are a little salacious and don't have context and just makes you kind of say, oh, what a terrible person. Uh, there was none of that here. There was nothing in here that was like bad. It was just they changed their mind. They don't support Democrats anymore. And it, it really lost its oomph there because usually there's some, oh, he grabbed her ass or, you know, all of a sudden, you know, he's he's hiding this or hiding that. It's, none of that it's, exists it's, here. The, the sort of implication that she was betraying black people, I thought, as a black woman was gross. But I agree that it could have been actually worse. Um I still think it was bad. Uh, I control left for the word black in the article, and it, it is mentioned 14 times, the word black. I mean, this is like, she's totally coming at this angle of, you know, I have a certain way that I think black people are supposed to act, and Felicia is not acting in that way, and therefore she's bad. Um, so she's I, I think a race that was traitor. absolutely a, a, uh, an element to it, which is, is yeah, it's kind of like sure one of those the things where- And that's the game that she's trying to play. Um, and it hurts. The reason it hurts- Felicia is because Felicia's done so much on like over the last few years. I think the A16Z had the culture fund, like Ben Horowitz also, like they're very invested in black culture and stuff. So it was a very sensitive place to poke, I think. So white newspaper owner, white editor, white reporter tells the black lady what to think and what to do. Many such cases. <laughs> We've seen it's it a also, lot. It's Go also ahead. like, why did she get dragged in to begin with? Like they point to like her, uh, she like removed some pictures of her with like liberal politicians on her social media. That was their justification of like, she's the far right MAGA person too. Like, why did she even have to be involved? <laughs> she retweeted the endorsement and retweeted, retweeted the endorsement. Ben, ben's Which is endorsement. You're right. It's crazy. Like she's not, she's not Ben who did a 60 minute YouTube with Mark on why he was supporting this person and giving money to them. And then you went after his wife is it's, it's just, it's really interesting. The, she changed her Twitter profile, her ex profile to say, escaping the matrix, which of course is like this Andrew Tate idea, but she's not the first black person to do this. There are many black people in Hollywood who are, are in, in fame and wealth that have said, gee, I've kind of been forced into this decision by lots of people around me that I have to be a Democrat. And so many of them, like Little Wayne and others have said, maybe I want to just think for myself and I, I don't, I'm not. I'm not signing up for this anymore. And I think that that's sort of like not atypical. Like, so to focus on her that much is, is again, I, I, I'm not surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if Moritz or, you know, kind of there was, it may, may not directive, but kind of like this understanding that, hey, wait, the two biggest VC firms, Sequoia, A16Z, it, it certainly didn't fall on anybody's. Uh, Excuse me. They're not the two biggest VC firms. Let's just. Calm down. They're they're <laughs> up there. They're they're a handful. I mean, there say. must have been. I guess I guess one question maybe to explore or, or might be fun to think about is why does Ben and and Mark, you know, sort of defecting from the Democratic Party mean so much to people who read the Standard yeah. or people in that orbit? What what is the meaning of a sixteen Z or at least the leadership of a sixteen Z mean? Well, um, we did reporting on. Remember the if you look back at the donations, the A16Z was right in the middle. Mm -hmm. They had not gone left or right. Like Founders Fund was out there, right? Like we know where Founders Fund, we know where Peter Thiel stands. Um, Sequoia was on the opposite end of end of the spectrum. We know where Sequoia stands. A16Z in the, is in the middle, and so there's a war for the middle. And where the middle goes, that's it's very threatening. If the middle, if the middle leans right, it's always we like I always am one like Founders Fund never gets targeted ever by any of these people. I mean, Peter got it relentlessly in 2016, but like recently, everyone kind of knows it's not worth it, in in my opinion. With them, you know, is there a chance that you can scare them back into the center or back onto the left, possibly? And then on the the question of race specifically. Yes, Martin, to your point, we've seen this before with famous people, but right now in this election, 
we're talking about the black vote in a way we haven't talked in my entire life. It is it, it, in the, we talked about it right after Trump won. It was like, oh, that's odd. Like there was a bump in in black people voting for Trump. It was still a minority, but it was a it was the most that any Republican had gotten uh, in in many 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 years, maybe in our lifetime. Now we're seeing a lot of black people supporting Republicans. I, they're still not going. They're still going to be overwhelmingly Democrat, I think. But this is a trend that, if it continues, really, I think, existentially threatens the Democrat Party. Like that, it all throughout these, like the, all of the South, all of the, the even the Rust Belt states, like to, to lose a like what ninety percent of the black vote, which is what you're counting on, to lose that is very threatening to the party. And I think that you're going to see probably nasty attacks like this increase uh, uh, targeting black people who waver. I also wonder if you have a doppelganger effect with with uh, Ms. Horowitz in the sense that here you have a wealthy, intelligent black woman with a white husband and Kamala sort of you can superimpose that. And the de facto opinion, again, if you saw The Breakfast Club with with Biden, you ain't black if you're if you don't vote for me. You know, this sort of approach uh, and he takes brings out the ain't, you know, to, to connect with the black person that, you know, this 85 year old man or whatever is thinks he can connect with. Um, and so I wonder if like, you know, you have this uh, again, de facto, like, well, how could you not be Democrat? You have a mirror image woman running for president and you're right. you're not with her. It's it's insane. Um, and what's interesting is there are also families, prominent families that are against each other. She yep. could still be a Democrat. Um, you know, so the fact that she's willfully, you know, and, and if anybody's sort of like, uh, okay with a little bit of, you know, PR strife or something, A16Z, I don't think it would have been a problem if she said, you know what? I love you, Ben, but I'm still a Democrat. I'm going to keep a photo of myself and Obama on my Instagram instead of deleting it. She clearly made up her own mind on this. It's not, uh, in my opinion, like, oh, husband's Republican. I got to be Republican. I can't embarrass him. I don't think that's maybe in like an oil family or something, but not here. Maybe Moritz realizes that she's actually the one pulling the strings. Like she was pilled first and she dragged Ben. She was like, we got to get rid of we got to get rid of these Democrats, man. Um, Who knows? Story for another day. What we have to do right now is, I mean, just prepare yourselves. We're about to start. Pirate Idol. Welcome to Pirate Idol. Okay, guys, uh, we, I mean, the hotly anticipated segment. Um, I've announced it on Twitter. I announced it on last week's episode. We are on the hunt for a new co-host or a contributor. We'll see how it goes. Um, but certainly someone to kind of regularly occur, uh, regularly occurring guest on the show. Uh, we had tons and tons and tons of applications, uh, way more than I expected. I was like, whoa, people are down to join the pod. Many of whom I wonder, are they going to be allowed to join the pod? You have real jobs. Some of you are competing media companies. We'll worry about all of that at a later date. For now, what I'm interested in doing is just actually going through the group really quick, uh, sort of welcoming each of you. And I'm just, for a second, I was like, wait, are we missing someone? No, you're all here. Let's welcome each of you. I want each of you guys to sort of tell us who you are. Um, and then Riley's going to break down the topic and we're going to get to the competition. I'll explain the rules uh, after introductions. Actually, fuck it. I'll explain the rules now. So the rules are going to be like this. Um, Riley's going to break down the news item. You are each going to deliver a take. You are allowed to respond to each other's take, to sort of like cross talk, to ask questions, to dunk if you want to dunk, if you're ready for a dunk back. I mean, that is sort of on you. Uh, at the end of the take, when I sort of feel the take has been delivered, I am uh, the panel of judges. It'll be me and then a, Martin's our guest this week. So I think it's probably mostly going to be me and Martin this week. We'll deliver our sort of Simon Cowell, Paula Abdul-esque, um, I guess, assessment of the take. It's not clear yet who is going to be Paula, uh, Martin, or myself, but we'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> Riley, step on up and, uh, and deliver the news item that we're going to be discussing in today's final segment um, of the Pirate Wires pod. Sure thing. So to set the stage for our contestants here. So <laughs> Germany's decommissioned nuclear power plant, Grafen Reinfeld NPP, 
uh, was demolished last week. Uh, this plant was constructed in 1975 um, and commercial operations began in 1982, um, though it was closed in 2015 as part of the government's policy to transition away from nuclear power. Um, the demolition of Grafen Reinfeld was delayed slightly um, after a pro-atomic energy activist named Andreas Fickner scaled one of the pylons in protest of its destruction. I have so many so questions. With- <laughs> So with wind energy also experiencing slower growth in the country of late, this suggests that Germany um, will be increasingly reliant on crude oil as well as coal, something that already makes up 19.5% of Germany's utility scale energy generation. So listen, I want to start by just saying we don't like to cover European anything, generally speaking. (laughs) Who cares, right? I understand that. But this is funny and... I think broadly, it is an issue that is sort of broadly relevant uh, here at home. So I I think it's worth discussing on the Firewire Spot. Um, And the first person to do it is my man, Chris. Um, Give me a few, before you get started on uh, just like what you think about this, uh, where are you from? And uh, and like, what are you all about? What's, what's, who, who are you? What brings you to the Yeah. Yeah, definitely. First, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Big fan of Pyro. Part wires. You got it, man. Uh, originally from Iowa. Um, I spent a little bit of time living in Japan. I've kind of lived all over, spent 10 years in California, been in Texas now almost eight years. So kind of popped all over around. I've always been in technology. Um, it's kind of like uh, first got started in venture capital and technology, self taught programmer designer. So um, very passionate about technology, but also how the implications that it has on broad topics like energy. Sick. Well, the view is spectacular. Can't beat that. Um, I don't know, man. What do you make of this? Uh, what do you make of the... What was the word that you used? The dystopian job, Riley? I believe it was prof- professional nuclear activist. Was that what it was? Pro-atomic energy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Broadly speaking, I think nuclear energy is the mother of all litmus tests for cognitive dissonance. It is just unbelievable to me that a climate activist would be somehow praising, you know... The idea that uh, we're going to take away a good energy source. And when we do that, typically when we take away nuclear, we traditionally replace it with coal uh, or natural gas, uh, which from that perspective is way worse for the environment. I think it was also some of the things that I was looking at from um from the perspective of Germans that they might also have to now rely more on energy from France, uh, who produces the most amount of energy uh, uh, in terms of like their production from ener- from nuclear sources. Uh, so it, it for just from a broadly speaking standpoint, I think that it's uh, a great litmus test for people that uh, struggle with cognitive dissonance. Yeah. I mean, Riley, I have some, uh, I have a, f- follow up on the news item. I I was sort of confused about the actual news item itself while I was watching it unfold. So they're tearing down the nuclear plant because of anti-nuclear sentiment. But then what were the people protesting? The protester is pro-nuclear. He's a pro-nuclear guy. He is, he wants nuclear. He scaled the pylon in protest of taking it down. He was trying to prevent it from the cooling tower. He's a pro-nuclear. So I actually, so my original, when I just, I mean, this is a problem. I got to stop doing this. But I, I kind of just absorbed the headline and intuited what the story was about rather than click. Um, and I sort of, for some reason, suspected that it was like another environmental concern about blowing up the tower. So it, it wasn't really about being pro-nuclear, but about like maybe there was asbestos or something in the towers. And he was like, no, we can't do that. Um, I guess this is a, a little bit more sane. Uh, I guess... I feel bad doing judgment now. I don't know that we should do that. Is it weird? I wish that we had I wish that we had a live interaction from the audience to decide right now. I think it was a great I think you did a good job, Chris. I don't I don't have a problem with the take. I do think here's what I think though about it. I'm going to give you a little bit of not really pushback on the take, but just my thoughts on this in general. We have to get better. I'm pro nuclear obviously. Maybe not obvious. I think probably obvious to anyone who listens to the podcast. I I do think that a couple of years ago, maybe even like like four or five years ago, nuclear became the take that was safe to take. It became the sort of contrarian take that was safe to take. And Mm. it was a rational take. Um, It was just, it's obviously correct if you care about the environment or just more energy or really almost anything. Uh, 
there are these little drawbacks like nuclear waste and things which we can talk about but but on net it's the the, the like the thinking man's take is to be pro nuclear and what's up with these idiots who are against nuclear that was important 5 years ago because there were not many reasonable takes you could take 5 years ago so like t- 2019 2020 was a very different landscape than 2024 and so now i find myself a little bit bored with the pro nuclear take not like i want to switch it up and be anti nuclear but i think that we need to do more we can't just be like we should do this while nuclear plants sort of keep collapsing as we go i don't know martin am i like roughly correct about that what what are you, what is your gut on that yeah i think you're right um but if if we're judging are we here to judge Chris? I think we're going to like judge, but like not say we're judging. It's like we're actually okay. we're like having a conversation with Chris. I don't, I mean, you can just, you know what? Fuck it. Judge, <laughs> judge well, him. Judge him, Simon like Cowell. It's like Pirate Idol. Like you got to give, you got to throw it at us a little bit. There's, there's a difference between having the right take and being entertaining. And um, ideally you do both. You failed spectacularly at one of them. <laughs> and um, the, the other, and it, it keeps me from even bothering to look at the other one, so. Well, I think you're, th- I like, I like the thoughtfulness. I liked the, I mean, I love the, I'm, damn, <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> Martin. I think, I think though, yeah, maybe the, the take on this, this specific activist uh, delaying, I, I do believe that on the outskirts, there was a lot of people there um, that were watching the demolition who were advocates of it being taken down. So, um, yes, oh, maybe yeah. this specific ag- activist was uh, saying, hey, I don't want this thing. We, I am pro-nuclear. Um, there are tons of photos, I think, of people that were very excited are about you? the idea of this thing being taken but down. You have this whole continent shooting itself in the foot, committing suicide. You know, as we I mean, we're watching Europe burn and shooting itself with, you know, let's dismantle nuclear, let's stop ourselves from using AI, let's put cookies on everything. I mean, it, it is really like a, a continental suicide. And that's interesting. And I think to, to you know, when, when you're up and trying to entertain people as well as be interesting and intelligent and inform them, you have to find something like this guy scaled the, uh, <laughs> did he actually scale the thing? I mean, that's pretty amazing. I don't know. <laughs> but I just tell you that like what I think happened is entirely divorced from reality. I've created an entire elaborate fantasy of what was going on at that power plant that I, I am increasingly learning is not tethered to reality. I will say, Matt, if you could pull it up, this is another story I'm about to invent. I don't know what it is, but I rem- I think I remember, I remember a, a weird. There was like a lesbian sex thing as it, in Germany. There was like, a, was it two lesbians talking about it's better than sex? Like anti? Yeah. Is that what it was? Grant, what was it? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. They were basically like, oh, sex is good, but have you ever like destroyed <laughs> your country's industrial base? That's like, what that it was. So good. That is They're what agreeing. it was. In this ongoing, and now Sanjay's here, so I, I feel like I can't harp on this one too much i think she gave me some plot armor so to speak um but i there is like this subtle evil lesbian thing that's been going on at pyrewired lately and so i'm like very keyed into it's not always listen there have been all sorts of evil people right the last couple months there have been a lot of evil lesbians um but that's a throwback and is funny and matt please just throw up her stupid tweet about that she got ratioed into outer space but that's when i learned also or reaffirmed this knowledge that i have that um that powerful dunks and ratios are not enough because they she won the, she won it's and I hope it's better than sex uh, Jesse what I would love from you All after right. a little hello is uh, hello. I want the steel man I mean you said you were going to bring a steel man I yeah. if you have it in you I would love to hear the anti nuclear take. Yeah. So real quick. Hi, everyone. My name is Jesse. I am based right outside D.C. in Northern Virginia. I work in tech. I've worked in tech for the last 11 years in pretty much any sales role you can think of. I've been inside sales, outside sales, uh, been in tech in California, been in tech in Boston. I moved over to Dublin, Ireland for a while to work for a tech company. So um Really wanted to just be a part of the conversation. I love the podcast. I listen every week. So that was why I reached out. Um And I think like the first thing I want to say about this is like for starters, just to set the stage, Germany has a history of just making terrible decisions when it comes to their power and energy. Like, Like, yeah, like I guess, yeah. (laughs) Like, this is a country that notoriously gave up like their self reliance to Russia. Um, So, you know, like, I think that it's easy to come on here and say, yeah, it's so dumb of Germany to blow up this plant and they should be pro-nuclear. Like you said, that's a boring take. 
what I immediately thought of when I saw this this morning, I actually think like the context of how Jeremy got here is the most interesting part of the story, right? And what America can learn from it. So a lot of what got us here is like this emotionally based decision making in Germany that is rooted in guilt from World War II. That's it. And America needs to like learn like this guilty decision making isn't helpful. So if you throw back to 1989, Berlin Wall falls and Europe is in this moment and especially Germany, right? Like they've just been united of, oh, yay, like peace has come to Europe, right? This is their like insert, we did it, Joe, moment for for them. And uh, Germany then makes this crazy decision that they're going to tie themselves to Russia for their gas supply. I think it comes from hope misguided, uh, but I'm not the most like hopeful person. So it's easy for me to say that. And then two, I think from guilt, right? Like, I see you want to jump in. Go ahead. Me? Yeah. Oh, you look like you're going to jump in. No, I'm trying to get better at that because people are always attacking me for talking too much on my own fucking podcast. Not you guys. Talk away. I'm like so, excited to talk no, to you. No, you get, so. <laughs> get, 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 take it away. I'll have plenty to say once you're done, but like finish your time. Okay. Yeah. So basically, you know, they, they made this decision. And I think in the, the context of nuclear, like they're not, Germany is not being logical about why they're anti-nuclear. It is a, you know, if there is the smallest probability, no matter how remote it is, that there could be another catastrophe in Europe because of a German nuclear power plant, they don't want it. It's Mm -hmm. like a non-starter for most Germans. And so I don't know if any of you have like actual German friends, not Americans with German German. heritage. I lived in Spain briefly. Um, I lived in Barcelona and it was in the Bush years. It was during the election of Sarah Palin. So everyone was very animated. Not everyone. Americans were animated. I would read about it on the news. In in Barcelona, no one gave a a shit about anything when it came to politics, except this this German who I lived with, who was relentlessly (laughs) wanting to talk to me about politics and really like blame me for Bush. Um, Mm. And then I was trying to explain to him, I was at my most anarchist at that point. And so I was trying to explain to him like the principles of anarcho-capitalism in broken English, which is what he spoke, and it just Perfect. It didn't work. But that's my exposure to Germans. That and also I learned that they have a weird thing on vacation with Brits where they both try and steal the, the chairs at the beginning of their vacation. That's all I know about them though. So if you want to educate me further, I'm open. Well, I had a similar experience to being how you got blamed for Bush. I was in Ireland when Trump was president. And so... I got to be like the American spokesperson. I remember showing up to a meeting and my client was like, oh, are you here to buy us? Because it was the day that Trump tried to buy Iceland. I would have been like, you you wish. You actually fucking wish. (laughs) Well, I was in the UK at the time and I was like, isn't Brexit supposed to happen for the fifth time today? And like just kind of went back and forth (laughs) with them. So they're like actually cool, but that's side note. But anyways, so when I talk to my like German friend, it, it blows my mind how much like this World War II guilt like still influences all their policy decisions today. And so the I mean, they should be pro nuclear to your point, right? Like it's better for the economy. It's better for the average German person. It would bring down costs. They could be taken, a, you know, break some reliance on, on Russia. But now they're just going back to coal. Yeah. And it's like, I think it's kind of funny because they're very like pro environmentalists over there they they want to stop climate change um you know Greta Thornburg say, is <laughs> oh yeah I mean I don't know what is her I, she's like Scandinavian or something she feels German to me I think it's like the, she it's, does it's but she fascism. even like will say you should do nuclear <laughs> yeah. over coal like that's just like how much everything is divorced Which, from reality it's just so, like I I mean we could I wish we had a separate segment on Greta because the fact that she feels German oh, to us is interesting. <laughs> and it plays into your point right now that you're making about guilt because what do we associate with Germans is like Nazism. <laughs> it's like this person yes. wants to put me in a gas chamber. And when Greta Thunberg is talking, I get that. I like get that vibe. I get like a very, <laughs> what totally. like, march you off to the gas chamber vibe from that little totally. autistic Swedish girl, whatever she is, um, <laughs> who's now, I guess, pro-Palestine. Uh, you guys... Feel free to jump in at any part part of this, um, Chris Grant Cardick. I would say yeah. you know one thing yeah. is is you know how do how do Americans how does the U.S. learn from this? Uh, there's might be some yeah. argument that we are learning from this. You know, I think one of the proposals in the infrastructure bill was reopening a nuclear reactor in Michigan. Um, so and. While there is sentiment to close nuclear reactors in America, we don't seem to be on that path. So uh, I would hope that while we're not expanding our ability to generate uh, energy from uh, uh, nuclear power plants, at least we're not uh, shutting them down in the same sort of rate that 
that uh, place like Germany? Not yet. And I think it's it's the Germans seem so much more. I guess I'm I'm not fully convinced. It's, I, I agree with you that Germans have this weird guilt thing that defines almost everything that they do. Uh, but also the anti-nuclear thing is broad and deep. And even in countries where there is none of that. And it's like, I wonder if maybe they're clocking the, they're clocking the anti-nuclear thing as the way to be a good liberal, because that's what it was in like the seventies. And they just grabbed onto it and they're trying to sort of show people how good they are. And, uh, even at their own, their own expense, Martin, what, what do you, what did you want to say on that? No, it just really clicked for me for a second that, you know, when you have two sides, political sides, some of them will co-opt kind of these movements and say, ah, that's ours. And uh, it's kind of scary that's that's sort of happening in nuclear. Um, anyway, on the judging side, I think Jesse was a lot more fiery and interesting uh, than the other dude. I don't even remember Chris his name. is bringing oh, no, facts done. and okay. thoughtfulness. <laughs> and I don't want to hear this. this is let's, let's not get too bitter. I brought here. some facts. All of you Come are on. truly here, by the way. All of you are truly here because I opened your video and I thought, Oh, I like this person. I want like, and you'd all have done a good job so far. Let's just, I can't believe I'm the fucking Paula. Grant, can you please introduce yourself? I, I, and, well, I didn't think okay. you were going to be the Paula either. I'm not going to lie. Okay. People don't a, think it's about me. Twist. People think I'm this <laughs> asshole because of my Twitter and then they get to know me and they're like, oh, I could totally get away with murder as of like you as my, my, I mean, in relationships. Let me tell you one. I have one. Okay. I, my, okay. Grant, go ahead. Before I jump into like my like hot take, I just in responding to this, I just want to say that zero people died due to radiation in Fukushima. So as far as being terrified of like the worst case scenario, if there's a people I trust to properly engineer and uh, run the nuclear plants safely, it would probably be the Germans like for all of their faults. Like that's something that they'll get right. Um, so I'll, I'll lead with the kind of wait, pro- I got to respond yeah. to that, though, because two actually interesting things there. The first is Fukushima is what actually like helped even push them further down this route. Right. So like in 2011, when Angela Merkel was looking at Nordstrom, Two, they were like, oh, maybe. And then Fukushima happened and they were like, we don't want any part of this. Like the Japanese can't handle this. We can't handle this. And so we're going to tie ourselves to Russia. That's like a super smart plan. So they I'm, they actually doubled down there. And then you have to think about Chernobyl's impact on Germany compared to America, right? Like we, we think it's interesting and we like to learn about it, but Germans actually had like radioactive particles flying towards them. They were calling their sandboxes like death boxes. They had contamination scares in their middle. I don't know, man. So were they really worried about it? I don't, I don't buy that they actually cared about Chernobyl. I think they were so desperate to be like, look, the the Germans are, or the Russians are worse than us. That they were like, oh, it's so but, bad. These nuclear particles, look, how dare they? I think But I'm not saying they're on. actually scared for themselves. They're scared of the outcome. Like that's my whole point is like they can't risk a nuclear issue. From I just that. don't agree. I really don't think so. Yeah. I don't think they believe I, in that. I, I really don't think that. I really think it's more about the idea of nuclear and what it represents. I agree they're guilty. I agree that's probably motivating this somehow, but they're not afraid yeah. of a disaster. I think they just want to show people like we care about the environment so much that we're willing to like kill ourselves over it. And then somehow yeah. there's a cognitive dissonance there with coal. I genuinely yeah, think- Yeah, then they're going back to coal though. So it's like- Well, I think not it's like even... they just won't face that. I think it's like, it's this weird yeah. thing where- they're so committed to the idea that they're they're pretending the coal thing has got to be misinformation. It's just too insane. It can't possibly be true. They love to double down. Grant, where are you yeah. from? And okay. give me your take. So I am Grant Dever. I'm from Rochester, New York, currently based in Austin, but moving home. Uh, if you want to become a podcaster, you know, and have long hair and a mustache, you have to choose choose at some point. So I can't be a podcaster in Austin. I'm willing to sacrifice that. Um, all right. Uh, I think I'm, I may be represent, there may be other representation here, but I am a German American. My Uh-oh. grandmother grew up in Germany. Ooh, so I'm willing to strike number two. I'm, I'm willing to, yeah, yeah, that Germany too. So I'm willing to just go, go in on this one. I just want to remind people that um, the United Nations exists for maybe a couple reasons, but the major one is that every couple decades, the Germans whip them themselves up into a frenzy and try to make it everyone else's problem. So, um, so I think that, uh, you know, we should be, uh, sure to, I I don't think we should let them completely, uh, destabilize their, their country. Um, but you know, so far at least their, uh, bad policy, uh, and their current frenzy is mostly just, uh, eroding their own industrial base, which is still not good, but, um, you know, they've done worse. So is your, is Uh, your take that yes, it sucks, but it's a good thing because if, if they were like succeeding, 
in a really smart way, it would be sort of scary to have like a, a sort of competent pro German Germany on the map. They could, I mean, they could have a worse frenzy. I don't think it's good. I'm mostly just poking fun at the fact that Germany seems to get some radical political ideas and take them in directions that mm. are disadvantageous for their country, um, which, you know, has happened a couple of times in the, in the last hundred years. Um, and then I, I do want to comment on the, uh, the activist. It was really refreshing to see uh, climate activists that I agree with and also who engaged in, um, you know, an act of uh, physical courage, risking his body, risking jail time. He was briefly jailed, um, you know, and this was kind of the nuke bro equivalent of like a hippie climbing up a tree uh, to save an endangered species. Um, unfortunately, you know, this this actual act wouldn't have saved an operational reactor. It was basically determine whether or not they destroyed critical infrastructure that could be reused mm -hmm. in, in the future. Um, but either way, uh, you know, they didn't listen to him. They're not listening to his other great takes. Uh, and they seem pretty intent on having their industrial base go the way of the dodo. So my uh, <laughs> my my uh, my two takeaways: completely different country, different political economy. Um, but two things that I think Americans should take away from Germany's failures is one: uh, don't shut down your existing nuclear plants. Just, just like hard stop. Worth yeah. investing in them just to keep them alive. The a little bit of money you got to put in to keep that sweet sweet base load clean power, especially as we pass all kinds of stupid regulations to make it even harder to um, create new power. Um, can't let that happen. And then two, we cannot allow the United States to become dependent on a geopolitical rival for our energy supply or expanding our energy supply. And that's something most people just refuse to talk about. Instead, we want to show us graphs and be like, everything's okay. Don't worry about China. I guess we're sort of, we're now like butting up against another the, like the whole like nato man <laughs> like like i don't want to be paying to defend these people anymore like they're really i would say aggressively stupid about some of this stuff and they're not i was thinking the other day like if <clears throat> china invades berkeley okay which i don't know that it'll happen but wouldn't it be funny <laughs> wouldn't that be fucking funny uh if they do that you think that France is sending troops to America to defend us? Like not in a million years. I don't think that for the rest of this country's history, France will ever be back in our hemisphere defending us in the way they were during the Revolutionary War, which is the last time that we got an assist from France. So I just, I'm kind of over it. I, I, there's a global trade piece that's kind of interesting. You know, do we just net benefit? And I think probably, you know, that probably on, like our economy certainly benefits but that comes with all sorts of i don't know we're running out of out of time here i want to get through the nuclear takes but I, i'm just like i don't necessarily i guess what i'm saying grant is I, I don't necessarily care about them getting closer to russia if that means that russia at least is now taking care of germany rather than us and paying for it maybe i don't what do we get from germany that we need i don't think anything do, well i i I mean, the other thing is, you know, they're right leading, you know, one of the leaders of NATO in Europe, like to your point, it's more their problem than our problem. Right. And then the other thing that's insane is even after Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, Germany was still getting natural gas from Russia for seven months after that. And then like they did pause the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which pause. someone blew up. I don't know. <laughs> it was, was a pause. But, um, we paused. I like the pause. It's a, a good way well, to it. Well, it was, they did slow the, like basically they used the bureaucracy to like slow it from being opened up. And then someone was like, well, what if we just blew it up? You know. Um, <laughs> who do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, who do you think blew it up? Well, they're saying it was a Ukrainian oligarch. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I've read different things. I've read that it would have to be someone who has like a really skilled, um, like underwater charge team. And then I've seen people be like, no, this was an easy job. Like you could do it, but it's so tough. Like, I, I don't know anything about, uh, underwater explosives. Yeah, but you're on a podcast. Don't let that stop you. Don't let, it, don't yeah. let expertise stop uh, you. You know, I, I would guess, uh, it was NATO. I mean, I, I can tell you, I don't think it was the Russians. I don't think that makes sense. Um, who did it beyond that? Well, maybe think. actually, M maybe, Russia did it to because it looks like really bad. Uh, no, Russia didn't do it. <laughs> we probably did it. You guys don't think America? Did I think it, we probably or, like, did helped. it. I think like, we probably did it. That's a conspiracy. Well, theory. Yeah, that we so the reason that we maybe probably didn't do it is because we can't really do anything. I don't know that. I don't really. I have not seen any signs of competence from our government. So I'm a little bit skeptical that 
we would have gone and, do, and and done that. I mean, most of what we're able to do right now is give them money. I don't, may, but maybe I'm we wrong. I don't know. Martin, what do you think? Start with, with Grant. <laughs> I'm like nervous now for Grant. Yeah, you know, no, no, Grant did, did all right. Um, I definitely think, uh, you know, this this is a space that's outside of my comfort zone and, and bringing NATO into it furthers that. But I, uh, yeah, I mean, nobody knows who, who blew up the pipeline, but uh, I, I would agree that this administration is, was it under this administration? Did yeah. it happen during Trump? Yeah, it happened during ours. During yeah. It's Trump. Yeah. It, it, it's hard to say, but, you know, I could, you know, who knows? I think the CIA kind of independently operates from the government anyway. Yep. So, you know, it's a little bit hard to know. Uh, but that's that seems like something that would have to have come from a government. Martin, can um, you tell me about, but tell me about Grant's mustache. What do you think about that? I, I think his, I think his german background uh you know is very sus um and uh <laughs> i agree it's a point it's a, it's a point worth considering <laughs> but otherwise uh, i like the guy i'll claim i'll claim irish when it's convenient oh so. you're 50 50. so you yeah, lied at the that. beginning of you don't, it gets really so ambiguous you lied you know, about your, you it's know. okay lie by omission i see interesting <laughs> um karnik my man take us away Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll keep the intro short. Uh, I'm an investor in social graph ventures and I'm a new dad in San Francisco, just, you know, trying to stay safe out here. Uh, that's about it. Congrats. Um, for, <laughs> thank you. Uh, to stay safe. Where in the city are you? Uh, I'm in like Knob Hill. Okay. Well, crime don't climb. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've said that a hundred times since I moved. So um, yeah, basically my take here is like, I'm really worried that <clears throat> Nuclear is becoming a partisan issue, and I'd love to avoid it. So I'm going to kind of talk more about nukes, but then get back to this specific German situation. So I think what I'm really worried about is that basically like this, like, do we really want to live in a world where, okay, Trump wins, we get tons of nuclear power, and everyone has Bitcoin, or Kamala wins, and now, you know, there's wind turbines on top of my house, and we have a central bank digital currency. Um, you know, I, that sucks. And I don't want that to be, I don't want this to be a partisan issue. So how do we avoid that and uh, kind of learn from some mistakes the crypto community has made with Bitcoin? I think if you look at this global green party, it seems that they're really just anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. I don't think it has anything to do with clean energy or saving the earth. And it's very clear from all their actions. Every time they're successful, okay, we just get more LNG, we get more nat gas. Like, so obviously they're not trying to save the environment. It couldn't be more clear. And then on top of that, have you ever seen them protest China or Russia on building more nuclear reactors? No. And the worst part is they're not building just for themselves. They're building in Turkey, Hungary, Egypt, Uzbekistan, Argentina, Iran, Romania, UK. So like, this is gonna be a situation with like Huawei and 5G towers where we fight them and then, you know, build our own. But that seems to be the most concerning thing for me is becoming, it's becoming very partisan. But the one glimmer of hope is it, it doesn't have to be. So if you go back to the 70s and 80s, uh, the German Socialist Party actually supported nukes, uh, realizing that, oh, this will bring tons of jobs. Well, yeah, the state. Soviet Union famously is like the best <laughs> at nuclear after us. Yeah, the state can control it and we give everyone a job at the plant. And it's going to be amazing. And it turns. So I think we can get back there. And I think this Andreas guy who went and climbed these towers was amazing. I actually talked to Mark Nelson before the recording this podcast, a big nuclear guy on Twitter. He was telling me that Andreas built a ladder with his hands, like a homemade ladder to get up that tower. And so we're seeing this tree hugger inversion. Which why did he have is, to build a? Why do you have to build a ladder? They don't have Amazon in the same way. <laughs> they, they, Walmart, they hate so. capitalism. Euro, Euro yeah. moment. And so he built a ladder and he climbed it to save this great technology. Like have, I, they're down. All they have is twine and like you. Kind of like you get some sticks, but like they got nothing, man. Sorry, I keep cutting you off. It's just the idea that he had to build a ladder. <laughs> Dude, I know, if I, I, that. If I could, double quick. That's if I could, great. Sorry, if I could challenge you, Carter, I mean, why do you think that we can avoid partisanship? I mean, the 70s are a long time ago, and we, we seem to live in a world where everything has to be partisan. And the, the crypto... No, no, I, yeah. I, I think so, too. I, I, I agree with you. But basically, this point I'm trying to make is, like, this guy climbed this ladder to save a nuclear plant. When's the last time you... You know, when was the last story about someone climbing a tree to save something? And he actually made demands, too, which may have not been reported on. So he actually said the CEO has to come out and talk to me of this nuclear plant. He, <laughs> he just wanted it. Pretty, pretty ballsy. <laughs> Um, and uh, go I, I'll, I'll just make a point. So, like, basically, I, like, we we had a woman named Laura Loomer here in the U.S. do that for X. So, sort oh, of she like that. outside of Twitter. I remember she chained herself to the door. 
<laughs> Dude, when I first started writing Pirate Wires, the world was so much more exciting to write about. Like it was like crazy <laughs> shit every day. And we forget how fun. I mean, I was depressed. I thought the world was ending in 2020, but like was it was she on top fun. of the X or chained to the front door? No, she was chained to the front door. Right. It, she, I think she like handcuffed herself to the door or something. It was a crazy day on the internet. In the X. I was like, what? I but I was sort of I was like, yeah, like answer for your sins. Like bring him out. I want to hear why he's censoring us. Sorry, finish your point. We were like, we gotta wrap this one yeah. up. The very end of that point is, yeah, I mean, he climbed that ladder, he got on there, made these demands. And basically, you know, this can't be confirmed. The CEO is like, hey, dude, like, your actor is already decommissioned. Like, maybe do this, you know, wink, wink, do this somewhere else where it might actually make a difference. Um, and so I think it's interesting to take this kind of left-leaning clothing of climbing a tree and, like, just take that stance to, to save the killer. I agree with Martin that maybe with, I'm sort of, um, I agree, I share Martin's impulse towards skepticism on the partisan Question, because as you yourself said at the top of your take, um, this is not about energy and it, it it's about capitalism. And if it's about capitalism, and in America, at least, one of the parties is, I mean, as we were talking about earlier today in the pod before you guys showed up, um, I mean, the new democratic plan is not capitalist. <laughs> it is not pro-business. Um, and I think that the nuclear thing is perhaps being resisted as strongly as it is here, not really Germany, that's a different set, but in America, because it solves a problem. That's that's a useful problem for the Democrats to have. So if they lose the problem of, of, uh, of global warming to wave over people's heads and scare you out of more production, that's, a, that's one less weapon they have against, against business. I think th that's my sort of pushback on you. It seems like you have something to say, Grant. I just want to say that it, it's trended being uh, less and less of a partisan issue, particularly over the last like five years or so. Um, Congress just passed the Advance Act, which passed uh, like overwhelmingly in like a bipartisan way. Basically, Senator Bernie Sanders and Senator Markey were the only people who opposed that. That's a bill that basically gives more authorities and some, you know, a new mission statement. And it's basically trying to be a bipartisan signal to the NRC that, hey, we're actually we want to build nuclear now. We need to build it. Coming from both parties, I think that's a big step forward because nominally the last like four administrations have been pro nuclear. Like, but at the same nuclear. time, next generation uh, power companies are running into all the regulation and red tape that's slowing down. So I, I agree that I think there's things that are being done, but there are also things that are holding back some of the latest and greatest from an innovation standpoint. That is interesting. I, I wonder. It sort of does prove that the left's overall hostility to i think there's a i i that maybe doesn't prove i'm like it proves it proves the opinion i'm about to give you um it seems to me that there's a general hostility on the left towards new innovation because they correctly understand that that generally leads to new industry and industry generally speaking is like the only check on government power in this country and it maybe isn't even supposed to be that i, I think that's actually what drives the government industry tension there there is real power and especially tech now like it, that's a natural fount of of real power that in, has real influence on people's lives that exists for the most part outside of the government i think there's there's always a a fear of the next thing that's going to disrupt their power which is what a lot of almost all of the ai conversation is really about it mm -hmm. took the government 5 minutes to understand enough about ai to realize like okay this is another thing that's going to challenge our authority potentially and we got to do something about it I, I once did business with a company in germany i went to leverkusen and uh there's a company called bayer it's uh sometimes called bear mm -hmm. here the company is about 400 years old like that's the kind of company they, they want, like a company that's like really yep. enmeshed in government yes. and not new and breaking things and changing things. And well, you see in, the auto, really slow. in the auto example, you see this in, with, with Biden's, uh, you know, talking about every auto company other than Tesla. Yes, a really good point. Um, well, you guys uh, wait, Martin, you got to judge. <laughs> you got to lay down the gauntlet here. I like Jesse the most. You know, I think in this business, show, show business, you have to be interesting. You have to be exciting. You can't put the people to sleep. You're putting the people to sleep. Uh, Grant's, you know, second best. I thought Cardick was a brilliant guy, but again, you know, people want pizzazz. Look at look at the the average, you know, talk show. It's it's not boring. Well, and I will uh, say this. Um, thank you, Martin. But I want to say that on Pirate Wires. We have played with a lot of different things, like on the on the different groups. And Sandra, you know, just left, and uh, and she'll be back. We'll pro have her as a host, probably as a guest judge eventually. Um, I one of the things that Sanjana brought that 
I don't have and that nobody else on the team had was like a thoughtful, introspective, facts-based, just like laying down something that we could actually speak to. And I really relied on her for that. Um, I agree with you generally, Mar- Marn, about like what makes a good show, but I also need other stuff, not just that. Um, I... Uh, I don't know where Brandon. Okay, I thought Brandon Sorry, was Brandon's like, like I'm fucking over this. Um, <laughs> I guess to the people listening, I, um, I don't know how we're going to make this selection process. I think that you should vote in the comments section. Tell oh us God. who you want to join. Who who is your favorite this week? We're going to go for a few few more weeks, and I'll probably bring back people who ranked high in each episode and like have another one. Um, tell me who you loved. Tell me. Um, I don't know. Tell me something about Greta Thunberg. Uh, tell me you love us. Just tell me something. Rate, review, subscribe. Tell everybody. Um, what else? I have a note here. Oh, conclusion, right? Because this is the end of the episode. Uh, it's been real, guys. Another great week on the Pirate Wires pod. Touch grass. Goodbye. <laughs> See ya. <laughs>